Welcome back. As we mentioned, the U.S. debt stalemate caused markets to sell off today. Observers say if this drags on, it could further royal markets. Our next guest testified before Congress earlier today to share his expert insight on potential solutions. Dan Mitchell is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and a former economist with the U.S. Senate Finance Committee. So, Dan Mitchell, you were in front of Congress. What was the main message you took to them? In terms of the debt ceiling debate, my main message was that there is zero chance of default for the simple reason that even after the debt uh, limit expires, the federal government's going to be collecting about 10 times as much in revenue as is needed to pay interest on the debt. So unless the Treasury Secretary actually wanted to default for political purposes, and I just don't see that happening, we're not going to have any default. We'll have lots of budget disruptions in the U.S. The federal government won't be able to pay every hospital for its Medicaid reimbursements. Not every grant to every state and local government can go out on time. But there is no default. Is there perhaps a new time then? I mean, August the 2nd is the date we've been given. You're saying that they're going to generate a certain number of revenue that will not allow them to default. But does this extend it to a certain period in time down the road that they will have to actually address that debt ceiling issue? Well, the key question is, what do we mean by that? Most people in Washington refer to the August 2nd deadline as the time when the federal government might not be able to pay every single obligation it has. Now, maybe that'll stretch to August 4th. Some private estimates say they could go to August 10th, maybe even later. But again, all that international markets really want to know, is there any risk that the U.S. government won't pay interest on its bonds? And there is no chance of that happening. Let's talk a little bit about the plan that the Republicans are putting forward. There was supposed to be a vote today that's had to be delayed. Uh, but I understand a lot of critics are looking at that plan and saying that it contains phony cuts. And I understand also your organization is not entirely won over by this plan. What is it that is not real about the proposal that John Boehner is putting forward? Well, the first thing you need to understand is that phony budgeting is a long Washington tradition. It's been around uh, all my life, and I'm sure 100 years after I'm gone, they'll still be doing it, assume we haven't collapsed in some Greek-style disaster uh, by then. But what happens is, in Washington, a budget cut isn't when you spend less next year than you're spending this year. They define a budget cut as any time you increase spending but don't increase spending as fast as you might have planned to on the basis of, of some previous quote-unquote baseline. And in other words, let's take Congressman Paul Ryan's budget. A lot of people said that had trillions of dollars of spending cuts. But if you actually look at the numbers in the Ryan budget, government spending increases on average 2.6% a year. But because it didn't increase by, say, 5% a year, that gets characterized as a budget cut. So there's a lot of games like that. They play with these so-called baselines. If you want to assume big savings, uh, what you do is you just assume that we'll have full U.S. operations in Iraq and Afghanistan for the next 10 years, and then you assume that somehow all that's going to end within two years, and you get to claim all those savings in years 3 to 10, even though that's complete make-believe money. And that Republicans play that game. Democrats play that game. The key thing to look at is, what is spending this year? What will it be next year? What will it be the year after that? That's the only honest benchmark. And under that benchmark, unfortunately, America is slowly drifting to some sort of European-style fiscal nightmare. I'm curious to know, we started off this debate a number of months ago, uh, Todd, you know, the Republicans saying that we had a spending problem in the United States, the Democrats saying that perhaps it was more of a revenue problem. Uh, the solution eventually potentially has to be a combination addressing both sides of those issues. Where do you particularly see the solution coming from between spending and revenues? Well, if you're asking me my prediction, I don't think we'll have a solution. I think politicians will mostly kick the can down the road and America will continue to move in the wrong direction. And I desperately hope I'm wrong on that prediction, but I think it's the safest thing to assume. But in terms of what should happen, Historically, ever since World War II, we've had an average in America where federal government spending consumes about 20 percent of GDP and federal government taxes consume about 18 percent of GDP. Now, a 2 percent of GDP deficit is very, very manageable. Uh, unfortunately, what's happened is that spending has now shot up to about 25 percent of GDP 
And because of the economic downturn, revenue has fallen to 15 percent of GDP. Those are those huge one trillion dollar plus deficits that we have right now. Now, over the next three years, the Congressional Budget Office projects that revenues will climb back up to 18 percent of GDP. So the revenue side will naturally solve itself, even if the Bush tax cuts are made permanent. Our long term and for that matter, our medium term fiscal problem is 100 percent the result of government spending plateauing and staying at this level of 24 to 25 percent of GDP. That's what's driving our long, our medium term numbers. And then, of course, in the long run, because of the entitlement programs and the and the aging of the population, America does become Greece. It's a very frightening, discouraging outlook uh, because we have Medicare, Medicaid and Social Security that cannot be afforded. Even if we put in giant tax increases that would probably give us the stagnant European style growth numbers, there's no way we could actually finance all these entitlements, which is why I think the Ryan budget, uh, if Obama had been open minded and reasonable, could have been a very good way of moving on a path to restore fiscal sanity in America. Mr. Mister, we just have a few moments left. I just wanted to quickly ask you, you're saying there won't be a default. Lots of the street de agrees there will be no default. But so many other things are happening just because we've come to this situation. What do you think is the biggest risk going forward at this point? I think we have several risks, and it's not just U.S. risk. Uh, you know, yes, maybe Geithner will del deliberately default for political reasons. I think that's a very, very low chance. But we still have huge problems in Europe. We have potentially huge problems in Japan with their long-run numbers. There might be a bubble in China. We have sectoral issues in the U.S. with housing still being in trouble, and that can spill over into the financial sector. If you want to be a, a worry wart, <laughs> there are lots of things uh, both in America and around the world uh, to be concerned about, but they all share one common thing. Governments are causing the problem by being too big, being too involved in places that belong in the private sector. All right. Well, thanks for sharing your insights with us today.